So hello to those of you who I don't know, I've not met before. So I'm part of the, the research methods team um, for the, the McKnight program. My name is Sam. And this is a topic which we end up working with a lot when we uh, work with particularly these CCRP projects, because there is always the question of how do we determine our sample design and our sample size and our sample population and what is good practice and what is a sensible way of dealing with all of these questions that come up. So I'm going to start out with what I hope is a fairly familiar sort of example, even if some of the um, specifics will be different for you, because I'm at the start of my project and I want to understand the the farmers that I'm going to be working with as part of my project. So I'm going to be doing maybe a baseline survey. The example here that I'm giving is I'm working in Niger. So I have a nice map of Niger here. And I want to understand the various factors relating to uh, cowpea farming and the different constraints farmers might have, because I want to get some good, useful information to inform the development of my project and to also use as a baseline so I can track results later on to see if we've seen any improvements. So then my question is, okay, how am I going to, to find the farmers that I am going to interview for my survey? So I'm going to give you two very different examples, which are maybe two quite two of the most common approaches anyway that I tend to see coming from uh, the CCRP projects. So option A, I might do some kind of clustered national sample. So I will say, okay, I'm going to randomly select some villages. I'm interested in all of Niger. So I'm going to randomly pick 40, 40 rural villages. I'm not so interested in the cities. And within each of the 40 villages that I select, I will find 10 farmers. And I will randomly select uh, the 10 farmers that I will speak to. And in total, I will conduct 400 interviews. These numbers are just kind of representative and the methods for picking we'll talk a little bit more about later. But as a general design, hopefully this is a sort of familiar approach of randomly picking some villages and then within those villages, randomly picking some farmers. And I end up with my clustered approach here. Another alternative approach which we commonly see is thinking, ah, well, actually, I'm not going to do a, a national survey because in the previous uh, research that I've been doing or the university that I'm working with, they have a farmer research network already set up. And this already works with cowpea farmers and has 1,000 farmers uh, listed with their names and phone numbers and addresses. So I have this list of 1,000 farmers. So I can randomly select 400 of my uh, farmers from my farmer research network without thinking about where they come from. So I can still have the same sample size, the 400, but maybe my distribution of where these farmers are, it's not gonna be nicely 40 villages and 10 farmers per village. I might have some villages where there's only one farmer that gets selected. This village two, this might be a village which is very close to my research station. So there's lots of farmers that are there. It's a very large village, so there's lots of farmers that are there. So it's not gonna be evenly distributed in terms of my sample, because I'm not picking within cluster, I'm picking directly from the list. So hypothetically, I could go ahead and I could do both of these research designs. I'm gonna give you some results here, which are as if I have done both of the, the designs that I just explained. These are just slightly made up, but what might happen is that, okay, from my national sample, I could see a, an average cowpea yield of 435 kilograms per hectare. We're finding out that uh, cowpea made up about a third of the total income from crop sales within my national sample. But if I do exactly the same uh, survey, exactly the same questions, but from the different sampling approach from my farmer list, maybe this will tell me that the average cowpea yield is 600 kilograms per hectare. Uh, same survey, we can get some very different results from our two different survey methodologies, our national sample and our farmer research network list. So I have a question for you and I'm going to uh, hopefully launch a poll 
So have a think now about of the two approaches, which of these options do you think you prefer? Which option do you think is maybe the more representative? Uh, in inverted commas, we'll talk more about what we mean by representative later. But if you had to pick, which of these two options do you think you would prefer? And so I have just launched a poll. Oh, I can see somebody has voted already. It's anonymous, so I will never find out uh, who has said what. I can see ooh, five people have voted so far. Ah, people are being quick. If you haven't voted yet, please vote now. And I will press and last chance. Okay, done. So hopefully, can you now see the results of these on your screen? And uh, is it on your screen or not, Shifar? Can you like, see? Yeah, we can see. Ah, perfect. Yeah, so it's quite, this is almost exactly what I was hoping would happen, where there's a big difference in opinion here as to which of these options is better. So two people thought the, the national sample approach was better. Three people thought the uh, FRN list approach was better. And another two people said, ah, actually, I quite like both of these options. Nobody said they didn't like either of the options, which, which is uh, good, I think. What I would say here is both of these two options has pros and cons. So it's not a case of option A is definitely the best or option B is definitely the best. I kind of think the real option, uh, the real correct answer here is one that I didn't really give you, which is it depends on what your objectives are. So let's just go through some of these pros and cons for each of the two approaches. So sorry, I, I tricked you there by giving you a, a, a poll which didn't really have the correct answer in. So uh, just to rig it so that I would win. But in terms of the, the national sample approach, the pros here are that we get nationally representative estimates, as long as we do all our field work correctly and our, our random selection correctly and so on. It also means that the logistics and planning of our field work is going to be reasonably straightforward because we know that we're going to be doing 10 interviews in each of the villages that we submit. And we might think, okay, I could probably do five interviews per day. So if me and then my research uh, assistant go along on our motorbike, we can cover one village per day and we can drive around to each of the villages. And this is going to be quite easy for us to, to plan and do. So it's going to be a relatively straightforward process for collecting the data, perhaps, even if the distances involved might be further because we're dealing with a national survey. But in terms of the cons, we might have a reduction in our sample efficiency here because of the clustered design. And I'll talk more about that later. It does maybe add some complications to the analysis because we might need to think about things called weights and design effects. So because we're doing 10 interviews in each of the different villages, but not all the villages have the same population. Some of them may be very, very large, some of them may be very, very small. So we might need to think about uh, assigning different weights to different observations. And we might have to think about how are we going to select each of the farmers within each village? We don't have the names and addresses and the contact details. And we may also have farmers who are not interested in us or we're not interested in them. So some of these farmers may not even grow cowpea at all, or they might have very, very large farms where we're not realistically going to be working with them over the course of our project. Or maybe it's just a very, very small farm with only a very small amount of cowpea, which again may not be so interesting to us compared to some of the other farmers. And the farmers themselves will not have any incentive to participate in my survey. So there may be issues of response bias. If we come along and say, we're doing a survey, we're gonna ask you questions for two hours, uh, they might say, no, I, I don't know you, I'm not interested, I, I'm not working with your project before, so I, I, I've got no reason to participate. So there may be issues from that. And with our farmer list, again, there's pros and cons to this approach. So again, we can still get representative results, but what we are representing here is something different. Instead of thinking of a national estimate, we would be thinking of uh, an estimate which be representative of the farmers currently in that FRN. So it's a different definition of the population. It's still, because we're doing a random sample, it's still representative of that population, 
but it's a different population that we're representing. And in this case, the random selection of respondents is very easy. If we have a list of 1,000 names, there's lots of different methods we can use, which are all relatively straightforward to pick out our 400 names completely at random from that list. And we don't have that same problem of not knowing the farmers and them not having the uh, incentive to participate because we're building upon the existing relationships that we've got with those farmers from the FRN. So hopefully uh, we shouldn't have those same problems of uh, response bias that might come in to the, the clustered approach. And our sampling efficiency, again, is good because we don't have that issue of uh, farmers being clustered in strange different ways to where the population goes. Because they're all coming completely at random, those, farm, uh, those villages, sorry, that we have more farmers uh, in our sample are going to be the same villages where we have more farmers in our population. So we don't have to worry about weights or design effects in the same way. But there are negatives to this approach. So logistically, there may be some difficulties um, because instead of easily planning 10 interviews per farm, maybe the sample will give us just one farmer in a really remote village and we're going to have to drive five hours just to speak to one farmer and then drive five hours back home again, which may not be a very efficient use of our time. And again, back to that first point, this is similar to the first pro where now we're thinking about that different population, those farmers who are participating in my FRN, they may be very different to an average cowpea farmer in Niger or a very different set of people. They may be more engaged in farming. They may be more interested in research. Uh, they may just happen to be more local to where your, uh, your research station and your office is because that's how you initially built the FRN from within the, the more local communities. So that population may not be the population that you're actually interested in. Similarly, the population from the uh, national sample may not be the population that you are interested in. So this is where the first question we have to think about when we think about our sampling for representative results is representative of what? What are we trying to represent? Both of these could be valid approaches depending on our research questions. So we have to think very carefully about what are we trying to represent and then how can we represent it? So with our national sample, if we are interested in the, the national level results, I think option A is our right answer. If we're interested in a very specific, which is our, our pharma research network, then I think this is a very good approach. If we're interested in a different population, which is maybe somewhere between the two, then we might have to think about how we can go about finding that particular population. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the remaining uh, session today. So this is my initial example. I'll refer back to it as we go through, but there's kind of four key questions here, which I'm gonna try to talk through over the next, uh, well, less than an hour now, but 45 minutes or so. The first one is, is the one I've been focusing on at the moment of what is it that I'm trying to represent? Once you've got that sorted, you can think about, okay, who or what are we sampling? And then we can think about how are we going to sample them and how many are you going to sample? These four questions, I think, work in a hierarchy where you can't answer that who or what are you sampling until you've worked out what it is that you're trying to represent. And you can't work out the how until you know the who, and then you can't work out the how many until you sort of know everything else. So it's all building on top of each other. It's very tempting to jump straight into that final question, um, as we'll talk about in a minute, and say, oh, okay, this is, this is the biggest one for the budget, perhaps. But it's not really. All of these questions are important, and we can't start to think about the questions lower down until we've already thought about our previous questions here. So I'm going to take a little step back actually for secret hidden question zero. Why are we trying to think about representative results? Why is it important to get a representative sample? And so there's two main reasons we would think of here. We want to be able to claim that we have unbiased results. 
if we don't have a representative sample, we can't claim that we have an, an unbiased uh, estimate or unbiased results compared to our overall population. Because the whole purpose of sampling is we are trying to get something which is going to give us something which represents our population, or at least representative sampling, anyway. And with a representative sample, we can also quantify the level of uncertainty in our results. So we can have this issue of precision, where we can calculate standard errors and confidence intervals and so on to say our margin of error around these results. And with non-representative samples, it's a bit more difficult to quantify that level of uncertainty because all of our standard statistical assumptions publish our results or give us validity underlying our results when we come to try to justify why we've done what we've done and why the results that we've got are indeed valid and good and accurate. And so in order to be able to obtain these representative results, we need two key criteria, which is a random sample from our population where all of the possible units were able to be selected. So it doesn't matter if some are more likely to be selected than others, as long as it was possible in the process that everybody could have been selected. So this is why the second thing we need is the, the known probabilities of selection. We need to be able to quantify, okay, how likely was it? If it wasn't equal, like in our FRN list example, where everybody was equal probability of being sampled because we just picked, picked some numbers at random. In nationally clustered survey, it wasn't an equal probability that everybody would be selected because some villages are larger than other villages, but there's 10 interviews per household, uh, 10 interviews per village, sorry, regardless of the size. So we can work out there if we have the population of each village, the probability that any house would have been selected. But it's often not possible to have these two criteria, particularly the, the second one then, knowing exactly how likely it was for everybody to be selected. And a non-representative design is still potentially very useful. And we actually do these all of the time without realizing it uh, in agricultural research. If we think, for example, of, of an on-station trial, uh, an on-station variety trial, we know that our research station is not representative, is not a representative environment compared to the real world conditions that uh, actual farmers within our, our project areas we're going to be working on. We have more space, we have more resources, we have smaller plots, but we still use these anyway because they can provide us with very useful information about results and trends uh, related to our, our data and our, our research questions. But from the design itself, we can't claim that what we see in a research station will necessarily be true when we come to apply it outside the research station. I think there's been many examples uh, that you can find of, of varieties which worked very, very well uh, when they were tested in a research station. But when they came to be tested in, in real world conditions, it turned out that they just did not uh, turn into anything as promising as they initially thought they would be. So we need to make informed assumptions about whether we think a non-representative environment, a non-representative sample is going to be representative is going to be um, followed through when we come to look at it outside of our sample, outside of our data, outside of our experiment. So a non-representative sample provides evidence and it provides understanding, but it doesn't necessarily provide us with representative estimates. So there's a difference between what we get from a representative sample where the key thing we're finding is, okay, an estimate of what we are seeing in a wider population within a non-representative sample. Particularly when it comes to, to qualitative work, you've got lots of these purposeful sampling strategies where you can come up with, you know in advance, you're not getting a representative sample, but you're maybe interested here in targeting um, particular components. So you might be looking for some extremes of your data. You might be looking for the richest farmer and the poorest farmer just to try to understand what's happening there, even though you know 
they're very different to your general population of farmers. Or you might be looking for similar people in different locations. Or you might be looking for sort of a snowball approach, like okay, finding one person and then seeing who they've been working with and then seeing who they've been working with and so on. So this link that I've given here has, has 40 different uh, qualitative, uh, non-representative samples, which can help you answer slightly different questions. You're not going to get something which is a representative estimate of your population, but that's fine because that's not what you're trying to do when you're going down this, this approach. And some of these qualitative uh, designs could also be applied to more quantitative analysis as well. So it really depends when it comes to a non-representative sample, what your question is. So moving back to the more representative sample, I think I've talked about this already when I was talking about the difference between the two options A and B, but the key thing to really work out is what is my population? What am I trying to represent? And so far I've mostly been talking about uh, people, and farmers, but this isn't just linked to human sampling. Uh, this is any kind of sampling. All of these questions still apply and they just might be slightly different. So we perhaps would use the word domain if we're dealing with non-humans. Uh, we call it a study domain rather than a study population perhaps. But the meaning is generally the same. So if we're thinking of our question about cowpea farmers, do we mean all farmers? Do we mean the farmers in Niger? Do we just mean the cowpea farmers in Niger? Do we just mean the female cowpea farmers in Niger because our project is only working uh, with female farmers? Do we mean only those female cowpea farmers in Niger with less than five acres of land because we're not interested in, in any farmers who have very, very large farms? Thinking of the criteria, thinking of this definition is very important because with each of those different subcategories, if we were to get a representative estimate of the average cowpea yields, for example, all five of those different criteria would give us a different estimate. If we had all farmers in the world versus all farmers in Niger versus just the cowpea farmers in Niger versus just the female cowpea farmers in Niger and so on. So we have to think quite carefully when we come to define our inclusion criteria, who is going to be in, who is going to be out. Having all these lots of criteria is something that people tend to shy away from a little bit in agricultural research, I found. But it's something which in other areas of study is very, very common. So, for example, this is, this is a clinical trial, which I just happened to go onto the official registry of clinical trials in the UK. So every clinical trial has to be registered. Uh, so you can see at the top, this was trial record number one. So this was just the most recent one to be registered uh, when I went on. And they always in, in medical research have an epidemiological research have very, very strict inclusion criteria. They're for a combination of reasons, both sort of medical and ethical, but also to really define the exact population that they're interested in working with We'll have a long list of saying, okay, we don't want, I think these are the exclusion criteria for this study about whether cranberries can help your brain. So they don't want people with high blood pressure. They don't want people who've had a heart attack. They don't want people who are taking particular kinds of drugs. They don't want people who, so high flavonoid intake is, is cranberries effectively. They don't want people who are already eating lots of cranberries and so on. And they don't want people with claustrophobia because they'll have to image their brain at some point. So for all of these medical trials, they always think very, very carefully about who exactly is in their population. And there's multiple different reasons why they might be in, not just convenience and not just uh, ethical issues, but also thinking particularly about, okay, we don't want the farmers with very large amounts of land. In this case, they don't want the people who already eat too many cranberries to be useful to uh, be included in this trial. And we also have to think as well about whether our population is the thing that we're interested in. Are we really interested only or mostly in, in the overall population, 
or are we interested in comparing different groups within that population? So for example, if my main research question is less about understanding the overall farmers in Niger, but I really want to understand the difference between the North and the South region of Niger. And it just so happens in my little diagram, villages one, two, and four, either in the North region and villages three and five here are in, in the South region. But if I look at my sample, I now have only a very, very, very small sample in the South region and a much larger sample in the North region, just because that's the way that my, my population is distributed, that more people are in the North than in the South. So if I just took a completely, uh, a sample based on getting an overall population estimate, which would be something completely at random, randomly picking from that list, I would have too small a sample in the South region to be particularly useful. I wouldn't be able to get very good estimates. So this is where I would think about stratifying my sampling approach. So instead of trying to get a population estimate, I would be trying to get a group estimate. So a group estimate of the North region and a group estimate of the South region. So I would intentionally oversample from the South region where there are fewer farmers to make sure I have a large enough sample size and undersample from the North region because there's so many farmers there that I don't need to have so many in the final sample that I get. And this is still a representative sample. And I can still get population estimates from this sampling approach, as long as I remember to apply these weights. Because again, my, my overall sample is now going to have too many farmers from the South and not enough farmers from the North because I intentionally oversampled from the South. And this is where I would, again, for a different reason, needed to apply weights to my design. Okay, so I'm just going to pause before I move on huh? to my next question. Uh, huh? Was there questions in the chat? Yes, we have one question from Lilian. She says, she recently felt, faced difficulty in determining a sample size and from a known population of 61 farmers and even unevenly distributed in three groups without necessarily under over sampling from a group or site and ended up determining her at and arbitrarily and using a formula she found online to work out numbers from each group. Is there a way one can determine N without having to choose your N arbitrarily and over and under and without over and under sampling? Okay, so that is an excellent question, which is almost perfectly going to lead on to my, my next few slides. So I will not answer it now. But if I do not answer it adequately in the next 10 minutes, then please come back uh, and, and we will review that question again. Um, but yes, no, that's a, that's a perfect question to lead into the next section. And but, I think Frank has a question as well. Frank, yeah, you yes. can go on. Thank you, Sif. Yeah, my, my simple question is, when you have um, a small population from one region uh, compared to the other, um, how, how, how do you comment about the issue of proportionate probability sampling? How best can we do it to make sure that we are, we, we are taking the, 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 the right sample? Thank you. So there's, there's a couple of issues there. The first question um, is whether you have the, the known populations, if you like, to be able to do this, this idea of proportional probability sampling. Because sometimes you don't know the populations. Um, you, you know that some villages are larger than other villages, but you don't know whether it's, okay, there's 10,000 people in this village and 500 people in this village, you don't have the exact numbers. So if you don't have those exact numbers, then the proportional probability sampling method is almost impossible to do well. And you'll need to maybe make some assumptions about how large each of these populations are before you even start to do the, the sampling approach. The, the second question is, is similar to the uh, example I was just giving where whether or not you want to even do that 
approach to have some villages be more likely to be selected than others maybe depends again on whether you're interested in having the overall population estimate or whether you are thinking about okay i I'm, I'm interested in a village level estimate or a regional level estimate where then that will modify the way in which you will need to um, to do the sampling if you have the data and which says okay here a population estimate then this is something which is the sort of technicality of actually the mechanical side of actually doing it this is something which yeah it's a little bit tricky maybe if that was your question for how to uh, do it but it's something that can be done in excel if you've uh, built the spreadsheet in the correct format uh, or other software packages but it's something that we would definitely as the, the rms team be very happy to help with the first thing that you would need to have is that listing of okay every single village and every single population in a nice clean excel file and that can be something which is, is difficult to achieve because it's not something which you can easily just do with a pen and paper the, the probability uh, the pps pr probability proportional to size population but i will not be talking about it in too much detail today but if it's something that you are interested in and you are planning to do a trial in that way we can certainly help and give you advice on that Okay, so I think. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you. I think I will move on to my next question, which, as you can see, I've put my four questions that I'm planning to talk about today. And I'm skipping from question number one to question number four, because this is, I tend to find the one that people uh, have the most opinions on and are often the most interested in. And this was exactly Lillian's question of how many should I be sampling for? Uh, and I tend to see two quite common approaches here. Uh, and I think Lillian has quite nicely demonstrated almost sort of both of them uh, here, but maybe more the second one, where either people will tend to have a rule of thumb, uh, which is what my first picture is meant to be representing, or people will have some formula that they're maybe not entirely understanding that they, they either found online or they were taught in their, their master's course in their statistics class. And they're not entirely sure what all of these letters and numbers are supposed to mean, but they're just sort of following a, a recipe. So in terms of these so, rules of thumb, I tend to see three quite common rules of thumb, although there are many more, where some people will say, okay, what we need is we need three observations per group. Or someone else might say, okay, no, no, we don't need three observations per group. Uh, what we always need is 20 observations per group. And then someone else will come along and say, oh, what we actually need is 5% is of the population. That should be our sample size. I would say all three of these rules of thumb are not very good. Um, there is some statistical basis behind all three of these things, but it's not really good statistical basis. So that the three per group, the people who argue for that, this comes because in order to calculate a variance in order to calculate a standard deviation, what you need as a minimum is three observations. But this isn't going to be a good estimate of the variance. It just means you can calculate a number. So this is this is definitely not a particularly good option. The 20 per group is a slightly better option because this comes from uh, the minimum number of observations for this theory that gets thrown around a lot in statistics, which, which is uh, key for getting a lot of our hypothesis testing of key values and so on, which is called the central limit theorem. This is a slightly better basis, but it's still pretty arbitrary, this 20 per group rule. And you can certainly come up with a better option here than just blanketly saying 20 per group. The 5% of the population idea, this is sort of people trying to be intuitive because often people will look at sample sizes for surveys and say, oh, how, how can you possibly justify um, claiming you have representative results for all of Kenya when you've only sampled 500 people? Because there are, there are over 50 million people in Kenya and you, you've only talked to 50 people or 500 people. You must speak to at least 5% of the population. But this is not an argument based at all in, in statistics. It's just somebody picking a round number. And very quickly, if you're trying to do a sample of all of Kenya or all of Niger 
you're going to have ridiculously large and completely unfeasible sample sizes. And equally, if you're dealing with quite a small population, uh, this might just be saying, oh, there's only 50 people, so you only need to speak to, uh, to two of them, and then you've justified it, which again is, is not a good basis. So instead of these rules of thumb, you might have done exactly what Lillian has done, which is look online, and maybe you found something that looks like this with all kinds of P's and Q's and Z's and K's, uh, and you didn't really understand it, but you could plug in some numbers to an, to an online calculator, and it gives you a number that's within your budget, so you're happy with that. Um, these are often quite complicated formulae, and there's lots of different sample size formulae out there. And each of them only really works when you're using it for the specific context in which it was created. And I tend to find people will have a few standard ones, maybe one or two standard ones, which they go to as their reference points and then just always use them regardless of what the question is. But if you're not picking the right formula for the right context, then this isn't going to be a useful process. So a different study design and a different research objective is going to need a different sample size formulae. And there are literally hundreds of them out there. And all of these formulae contain lots of different assumptions about what we are going to be observing. So it's quite a heavy process. It looks very scientific when you write down the kind of formulae that I just showed on the screen. But in reality, if you don't know what you're doing, you're just plugging in some numbers and you're getting an output. And because of the combination of not fully understanding what each of those numbers refers to, and the fact that there's so many assumptions underlying each of those numbers that you're using, it may not be a particularly good approach. And often these formulae look quite scary and quite complex. So people will just agree with you because you've done a, a good job of convincing them that this particular formula is the one that should be used because often people don't really know how to criticize if you've used the right formula or if you're using sensible assumptions within there because it's quite a niche area of study that people often only end up going into once every three years when they have to design a research design. Um, so we need to try to match our objectives and match our study design to a sensible formula. And this is definitely an area where having the support from the research methods team, I would uh, uh, strongly advise you to, to use us and lean on us when you're coming to this process, because I'm not going to go into different formulas and different assumptions and so on, because it's an area which really does vary so much from design to design. And this is something where people like me and Shifa and Alex, who I can see on the call, we deal with this sort of design element quite regularly. And we've come across lots of these different sample size formulae and know how they work and know what works where, just through practice and repetition and through seeing them used in different contexts. So we can really help um, build up those skills. This is where having a statistician involved in your research design is really important. I think the other areas of talking about today, you don't need to be a statistical expert to really understand and really work through. But these, this issue of sample size calculation and sample size formulae, the stats get quite difficult quite quickly. And this is why it's often more useful to work backwards. So instead of thinking about, okay, what sample size do I need? Thinking about, okay, what resources do I have available to me? How, how large a sample could I afford to do? So having too large a sample is almost never a problem. So as long as we're getting the data from, from something which is a well-designed process, having a larger sample, increasing our sample size will nearly always uh, increase the level of precision, reduce uh, the uncertainty in each of our estimates, and will also give us perhaps a better understanding of how multiple factors relate to each other. We can do more analysis of different subgroups because there will just naturally be more people in different groups, more people in different regions, 
more people who do different practices with their farms so we can do more different analysis from a larger sample. But if you have a bad design, even with a large sample, you get bias and you reach the wrong conclusions and you waste a lot of your time and resources collecting data you didn't really need perhaps. And you may even be able to not adequately address the key questions in your analysis if you're sampling the wrong population or you don't have enough people in particular subgroups. So this is where often we, we think here of, okay, what can I say if I have a sample of 400, like I did in my previous uh, examples at the start? If I had that sample of 400, instead of plugging in the sample size calculation to solve for N, I can plug into a sample size calculation to solve for, okay, what would I expect the margin of error in my results to be? Or what would I expect the smallest difference I could find between a the North region and the South region. If I had a sample of 400, this would maybe let me, let me claim that any difference larger than 5% was statistically significant. With a larger sample, I would be able to claim a smaller difference was statistically significant, but there will always be a cutoff point unless we are able to, to interview everybody in our population, in which case we have uh, we no longer think about the issue here of um, sampling if we have a census. And so a small, well-designed sample is nearly always, I put always, but there's probably some exceptions that I can't think of, but a small, well-designed sample is preferable to a larger biased sample. So I'm going to give you a very different sort of example here of proof for my point. So more or less this time last year, it was the run-up to the American election for the president. And on pretty much the same date, uh, I think this is from October, there were two different surveys done of asking people, okay, who are you going to vote for in the election in a month's time? So some person on Twitter who had lots of followers put out a poll saying, okay, if the election is today, who would you vote for? And 86% of the people that uh, participated in this survey said, I'm going to vote for, for Donald Trump. On pretty much exactly the same day, the, the sort of polling organization differently, which can affect the results, but it was more or less identical in terms of the framing of the question of if the election was today, who would you vote for? And instead of 86% of people saying Donald Trump would vote, uh, they would vote for Donald Trump, uh, only 41% of people said they would vote for Donald Trump, and 49% of people said they would vote for Joe Biden. Whereas only 10% of people on this Twitter poll said they would vote for Joe Biden. If you have a look at the sample sizes uh, on Twitter, over 80,000 people participated in this survey. But the Yuga polling organization, they had, well, about 80,000 less people. They only just had over 1,000 people participate in their survey. And a couple of weeks later, when the actual election came in, did 86% of people vote for Donald Trump? Maybe that depends on who you ask. I think there's probably some people who think they did, but the reality was, okay, Joe Biden got 51% of the vote and Donald Trump got 47% of the vote. So the Yuga polling organization with their sample of 1,000 was relatively close to the right answer here in terms of the final election results, given you know there are the few weeks between when that poll was and when the election was and people changed their minds and there's other kinds of biases that might be in there. I think that's a reasonably good uh, poll in terms of getting an estimate for the election. Compared to this poll, which is obviously completely useless uh, in terms of trying to give us something which represented what happened in the election. Because it didn't come from a proper survey design. Anybody could participate and there's no consideration of whether it's matching, it's representing the overall population. There's probably some people who are voting multiple times in there who really like Donald Trump. There's almost certainly some Russian bot farms participating in there and uh, people who are not in America and people who are probably not even people uh, and probably people who are not eligible to vote if they're under 18 and so on. Lots and lots and lots of reasons why this massive survey of 80,000 people is completely useless, whereas this survey of 1,000 people is much more useful.
Okay. Uh, again, I'll pause for questions before I move on to my third question. Uh, so we've got some in the chat. Alex says when we compute the sample size we need, does this actually mean the minimum sample size we need? Um, yes, uh, exactly. Um, so when we when we deal with those sample size formulae that pull out the number 472, that is, as Alex says, the minimum sample size to meet all of those assumptions and meet all of the criteria that we put in. So increasing the sample beyond that is totally fine. And Frank is asking, is it robust using 30 units as the minimum sample size? Yeah, so I think that's that's another one of these similar rules of thumb. Um, I've 30 is not one, at least that I know the statistical justification for, although I'm sure there probably will be one somewhere. But it's better to think about the question rather than having a, a blanket rule of thumb of saying, okay, 30, 30 units is always good enough or 20 units is always good enough. It's better to adapt the survey design, the sampling design to the specific question that we're dealing with. So in some context, 30 units will definitely be fine. In some contexts, 30 units will be nowhere near enough. So we need to try to think about what it is that is our question and just blanketly saying 30 is not going to be a good approach, I don't think. Okay, I think time is ahead of us. I think my next point though is hopefully the shortest one. When we're thinking about, okay, who are we sampling? What are my sampling units? And do I have multiple sampling units? Because so far I've just kind of been thinking about people and a little bit of villages. But if we're thinking of our, our agricultural research design, there could be lots of different levels involved in how this system is put together. So we've talked about villages, but within villages, you've obviously got households and there might be multiple farmers within each household. If it's a multi-generational household or if there is a um, multi-family household or if there is different farmers with different farms in each household. And the farmers could have more than one farm as well. Uh, they could have multiple plots within their farms. And if we're thinking about what's on the plots, we might also be thinking about the different crops and the different plants. And we might be thinking that this is what we're going to be observing and measuring. Or maybe it's a soil that we want to be measuring, not the farmers. It could be all of these steps. And there could be sampling required within every single one of this, these steps here. We might need to be randomly selecting villages and we might need to be randomly selecting households within villages. And we might be needing to randomly select farmers within each household and so on and so on and so on. So we often go straight to our, our lowest level, if you like, um, which in a household survey is probably our farmer. Or if we're doing something which is more of a, a trial, something where we're more interested in the crops themselves, then we might be thinking about the individual plots or the individual plants. But when we're thinking, say, of the cowpea crop, and if we're taking it away for some analysis to measure the yield, we're only going to be randomly selecting some of the cowpea crop to measure the, the yield, otherwise we're, or, or measure for any further analysis. Otherwise we're taking all of the farmer's field away. Uh, or we might be thinking, again, with the soil, we're not gonna be taking all of their soil, we're going to be randomly selecting some pieces of soil to take away for, for lab testing. So every step here could involve a sample. Some of them might not involve a sample, but we need to map out clearly our design of how does this hierarchy fit together and where do we need to apply the, the random sampling. So there's a big case as well. If we're thinking of households, we often get mixed up between households and farmers when we are doing uh, an interview. Because once we've reached the household, we might just think, okay, great, there is somebody here to speak to. So I'll speak to them and they can answer all the questions for me. But when we're doing the surveys, we're often you know, in a village in the middle of the day. And the people who are at home at that time are probably not going to be the people working on the farms who know the most about the farming. 
uh, if we're trying to go, go for as many interviews as we can in a day in the same village, it might be the older members of the family or the people who are looking after the children rather than looking after the farm who are at home at that time. So if we don't think clearly about who it is we want to speak to here in this jump between households and farmers, we might be introducing bias into our results without realizing it a lot of the time, uh, just from having a convenient sample within the household rather than thinking of a, a purposeful sample we probably would not necessarily need a random sample because it may be the case that we just want to make sure that the person we speak to is informed about the farm. So this may be where we think about changing our inclusion criteria rather than changing our sampling process for that particular case. Again, I'm not going to go through the implications of what would happen if you've got multiple levels of sampling required, because this will impact on our sample size calculations a little bit for thinking about, okay, how many villages and how many farmers and how many plots and how many plants. Again, it depends exactly on how it fits together for how much this will impact it. But the first step is always coming up with the clear design of what is it that sampling uh, what is it that I'm going to be sampling for my research and what levels are there involved and how do these levels relate to each other? Which ones are relevant levels to consider? Which ones are not relevant levels? Or which ones can we assume are not relevant levels to consider? And it nearly always turns out to be a little bit more complicated than you initially think this process of clearly defining those sampling units and understanding perhaps if you do have multiple sampling units. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the last question. Uh, hopefully I can get through in the remaining time of how are we going to be sampling? So as we've talked about already, there is this idea that we should be randomly selecting all of our units to get a representative sample. And if we have an equal probability of uh, selecting each of the household, each of the units, sorry, like within option B from the FRN list or the example that was mentioned earlier about uh, PPS sampling, it's a different approach to get an equal probability. Then just looking at the results from our data will give us a representative sample. If we don't have equal probability of selection, that's fine, as long as we remember to use weights when we come to our analysis. Okay, so why though is it so important that we do this process randomly? So I am going to launch another poll, if I can find the right button. Uh, so this is it's a bit different to the previous question. I'm gonna give everybody 30 seconds now to pick a number between one and six. Okay, I can see 11 people have voted. I will give you another 10 seconds. It's a very difficult question. Ah. Okay. So I am going to stop the poll there. You, you actually did all right here. Okay, I will show you your results. Hopefully you can see them on the screen now. Um, what usually happens in this process didn't happen here, uh, which is quite interesting. So th it, this has been, Maybe I will blame the small sample size, but when you do this in a large enough population, what you tend to see is people gravitate towards the number five uh, more than the other numbers. And people don't like picking them the number one, and they don't really like picking the number six, but three, three and five tend to be the most popular choices when you do this in a large enough population, because people kind of overthink about trying to be random and trying to pick a random number. So humans are not very good at being random number generators. We will often make quite stupid mistakes without realizing it completely unconsciously. So common sense uh, selections, usually common sense means not at all sensible. Um, so often what we'll see is oversampling of either engaged or interesting respondents. So if we're thinking of, of that list of FRN farmers, we may well know 
all of those 1,000 farmers or, or be able to talk to people who know all of those 1,000 farmers. So we might think, oh, yes, I know, I know Frank, he's really interesting, he's really good to talk to, we'll get some really good, uh, good data if we speak to Frank. Uh, and then uh, Alex, he's annoying, uh, I don't think he knows what he's talking about, I'm not going to get any good data if I speak to Alex, he definitely won't be in my survey. Um, and so on. Or we might we might think, oh, yes, Shifa. Shifa has a really interesting, unusual farm. So this will be quite an interesting person to speak to because her farm is, is very different to everybody else's and so on. We may do this consciously, we may do this unconsciously. And we can also quite easily end up undersampling perhaps marginalized respondents. If we have issues perhaps with language is a common one where we may either intentionally or unintentionally not perhaps want to speak to people who perhaps don't share our first language because it may be more difficult going through that survey process with somebody who one of us is not speaking our first language or, or maybe neither of us are speaking our first language in order to do it. Ooh, it's not moving. There we go. So it's much better to come up with methods which don't have any of these human biases in. And we can have a combination of some very high tech methods. We can write a whole bunch of code to pull stuff out. But a lot of low tech methods work equally well here for this random process, simply just pulling names out of a hat or picking random numbers between one and 500, um, which is something you can do on pretty much any phone or calculator or on Excel without having to write a whole bunch of complicated code. As long as these are random processes and, and random methods, it's much better than relying on human, human randomness, which can very quickly go wrong. So sometimes we might have this list that we can pick from or this list that we can code, uh, come up with our complicated uh, R code to pull out the, the random uh, units that we want to select from. But often we don't have this list that we can just pull names out of or that we can write the code on, like in option A. So what do we do in this case? And so we've seen already this idea of clustering. So we had a clustered sample where we selected villages at random, but then we needed to also select households within the villages. And this comes with a bit of a trade-off. So if we think here, we maybe have 16 villages and in our 16 villages, we, we want to select 40 out of the farmers assigned uh, 40 interviews sorry assigned to these 16 villages we could just say okay let's put all 40 of our interviews in the same village we can randomly select that village and then we can randomly select our farmers within that village this fits the rules that i've said before in terms of saying that to have a representative sample everybody has to be eligible for inclusion and we also have to have known probabilities we could probably work this out but it doesn't seem like a very good approach necessarily to me. Or we could say, okay, similar to the overall design I talked through before, we can go for 10 interviews in uh, four of the villages. Or we could go for 10 interview, uh, four interviews in 10 of the villages. And this is still, in all three of these cases, exactly the same sample size. And this introduces an additional uh, element to our sample size calculations and our sampling design in terms of this allocation between our different levels, our different units. So I'm just going to very quickly uh, show you an example. I have the link here to this online, uh, which I will share the slides at the end of the presentation, which you can see. Uh, hopefully you can see this flying into the screen now. Just to quickly show you here, this is my region. It's a big uh, rectangular area, which is my study region. I live in a very rectangular country. And each of these dots represents a different village. And hypothetically, I can't do this in real life, but I've already been able to work out the average cowpea yield in all of my villages. Um, so some of them over here are very low yielding. Some of them over here are very high yielding. Some of them here are kind of in the middle. So let's go something similar to what I've described so far. Let's say we're taking a sample of 400, uh, it's close enough, 400, 399, I can't quite get it in the right spot, 400 farmers and 10 villages. So if I press my sample button, 
I can see I've picked out 10 villages at random. So here, each of these 10 villages, uh, sorry, each of these 10 clusters is going to have 40 farmers. I've realized I've got this the other way around to before, but that's fine. Um, I can work from here. So I can calculate my estimated average yield, which is going to be here, 429, and my margin of error, which is plus 229 kilograms per hectare. And you can see in this case, I've got quite a good mix of high yielding, medium yielding, and low yielding. And if I do this again, I get a slightly different sample and a slightly different mix. And I will always have, though, a reasonably large margin of error here because of this clustered design. If I keep this 400, my estimate of 400 as my sample size, but maybe now let's move to 25 uh, clusters instead of 10 clusters. So if I have 16 samples per cluster rather than uh, 40 samples per cluster, hopefully you saw what happened to the margin of error around that estimate. Suddenly we have much more precise results for getting something which is almost exactly on the theoretical correct answer every single time I do the sample even with just a sample here of 400. If I go to the opposite extreme, let's say I've just picked two clusters, my margin of error becomes very large. Even though I've got 400 people in my survey, my margin of error is huge. And in this case, I do actually happen to have got something quite close to the right result because I got one high and one low. But if I do it again, uh, again, that's, that's not too bad, but some of these will end up being quite a long way away from the correct answer. Just by chance, we might end up with two very high or two very low. It's not really playing nicely. There we go. This time we've got something which is much lower than the real estimate. We're over 100 kilograms per hectare lower in terms of our average, um, just because we happened to select two lower yielding villages. So this issue of not just how many overall, but whether introducing this clustering is going to cause problems in the design means that for a sample size of 400, the implications are very different in terms of how we choose to allocate them, whether we would allocate them to small numbers of uh, interviews in lots of clusters, which is the most efficient design, but logistically is the most complicated design. because We've got to go to more different places versus going to a very small number, but the trade-off is our margin of error becomes very, very large. So the impact of clustering also depends on how different the, very, uh, the results are from place to place. So if something is very consistent in all of our villages, there's no difference in yield averages in our study region from village to village. It's only differences are farmer to farmer and not village to village, then, this issue of clustering is not so important at all because it didn't really introduce anything to the results by having this two-stage sampling process. It didn't matter which villages we picked. But when you get something which is very, very different from village to village, then this issue of which villages we select becomes hugely important. And the more efficient designs we get are the ones which are closer to simple random samples, just a single sample rather than this two-stage sample process, which introduces additional elements and needs to be factored in. So I quite like this because this is a question here where we did almost exactly the approach I've talked about for Niger, where we have, I think in this case, 15 interviews in a whole bunch of randomly selected villages. Uh, this is one of the districts within Nepal. And one of the key questions we wanted to understand is, okay, how, how long would it take you to reach a hospital in an emergency? And hopefully you can see this region here, the amount of time it would take to reach the hospital is very low because this is where the hospital is. And the further away you get from this point, the, the time it will take gets larger and larger and larger and larger effectively. So this particular question, if we were to look at the implication of the random selection, when we were trying to estimate within this region, 
what is the average time it takes someone to reach a hospital, we needed to make sure we had lots of different villages available. Lots of different villages with a small number of samples, because otherwise we could have quite quickly ended up with a very biased estimate, a very large margin, margin of error behind it. If our question was something different, like, okay, what is the, the gender of the head of the household or something like this, which would have a much lower difference from village to village, then this issue is not so important at all. And I think most examples that we will come across uh, are somewhere in the middle of those two extremes where there will probably be some impact on the location, but it's not to the extent of the question here, like how long will it take you to reach a hospital when there is only one hospital? Something like yield, for example, you'd expect different villages to have uh, slightly different average yields, but it's not gonna be as hugely different as, as this particular example. And this is one of the key things we need to make the assumptions about uh, when we come to come up with our, our survey design and our sampling approach. And there's also this issue of clustering versus stratification. And people can get a little bit confused about the difference between the two. So the clustering is where we are grouping the units to make the design more feasible. So we're, we're only here thinking about clustering when it's part of the design and we have to randomly select some villages and then randomly select within that village. The stratification is quite similar in some ways, but quite different in others. This is more similar to when I was thinking of the North region and the South region earlier. We're grouping units together because we are explicitly interested in comparing those groups in the analysis. So we always want to include all of our strata in our sample because we actually want to compare the North region to the South region. And so village, sometimes we might be thinking of as, as a strata if we only have a small number of villages and we want to compare them to each other. But in other designs, it might be a cluster because we're feeling, thinking about the whole of Niger and we're obviously not going to be comparing every single village in Niger to each other or even collecting data from every single village in Niger. So again, it depends on the objectives and how we define our study units. And generally, if we want a, an efficient and feasible design, we're going to have a small number of strata because each strata, as we increase the number of strata, that's going to increase the amount of data we need to collect, but then a larger number of samples per strata. And with clusters, ideally we want a large number of clusters and then a small number of samples per cluster. So we want to try again, it's a trade-off between what is feasible, what is logistically possible, and what gives us a robust approach. We can have to think here about what is realistic, what is reasonable, what is it that we are able to do, and is that sufficient for what it is that we want and need to do? Okay, I'm on to my final point. I think, I can't remember if I was supposed to do this in an hour and a half or an hour. Hopefully it was an hour and a half but I will pause for questions in case there are any now. So Carlo would like to know the software you are using for the clustered sampling and whether it's available. So the, the demonstration that I just gave, the, the link takes you to exactly that page where you can see that, that example that I've put in. And so you can play with that yourself and, and see what happens as you change uh, the different values. So what I use to create that little interface is uh, R, the software language uh, slash computer programming language, statistical software, which is my main tool for data analysis. It's something that we had last year, a training course on in sort of general introduction to that software. Once you've got through the basics, if you like, of R, learning how to do sample size calculations, for example, or calculate um, clustering impacts from your own data. This is something we could definitely help you with, but it's also, you would need to, need to do a bit of more general learning about the software first, like the course that we ran earlier in the year. It's not super user-friendly um, for somebody who's never used it before. You can't just pick it up and take it out the box and see what happens like you can say with, with SPSS or Excel. 
you might need a little bit of practice and a little bit of training before you would be able to to do um, uh, analysis of cluster designs or do sample size calculations for cluster designs. But you wouldn't need so much. The sort of level that you could get to from the, the course that we ran earlier in the year, I think, would be enough to start working if you had specific questions um, that you would be interested in learning more in the future. But the advantage of R is that it's free and open source. So you have to spend some time learning, but you don't have to spend any money learning. Everything is free, and uh, there are lots of resources available online in a very active community that can help you online as well. OK, I can't see any more questions. So I will move on to my final point, which is, sorry, I, I started to introduce this earlier because I got my ordering mixed up. But, but thinking about how we select within our clusters. So how do we select which farmers we want to interview, for example? And I sort of mentioned this a little bit more, a little bit already, where if we don't have that list of farmers, it can be a little bit easy to just go ahead and do a convenience sample of saying, okay, here are some people in the village, let's speak to them. Or here are some people that we know already. Um, so let, let's make sure we speak to these people we know because we, this is gonna be an easy interview. And this isn't going to give us something which we can claim is representative. So there's a few different options which are out there for how we select within a village. Probably the most common one that I see being used is, is either called a random walk or spin the pen or something like this, where we would go to a central point within the village. We would spin something to give us a direction. And then we would count how many houses we come across walking in that direction. Uh, and then if there was 10, we might say, okay, there's 10 houses in that direction. So I randomly pick a number between one and 10 using my phone or using a calculator or something like this. And then I go and speak to uh, household number 10 or household number four, whatever number is randomly picked. So this is an approach which it's okay, but there are some limitations to this particular approach. One key thing I think when it comes to be thinking about this is the methodology there, this, this random walk or spin the pen methodology, it's quite heavily based on what was done in America. Uh, I think that's where it originally came from in the early 20th century when the first people started using this for, I think they were looking at uh, health outcomes, vaccination rates within different houses and so on. And villages in America look quite different to villages in Kenya or Niger or Tanzania, for example. So on the left-hand side is what a village generally looks like in America. It's lots of straight lines and lots of very, very tidy lines uh, for where if you could stand at a certain intersection and pick a random direction and then pick, okay, I'm gonna do two lefts and a right, or I'm gonna count the houses down this road. It works pretty nicely for giving you a random sample because of how neatly organized uh, American small towns and villages tend to be. Uh, on the right, uh, this was, I think, in Kenya near Lake Kisumu. If I just sort of zoomed into Google Earth, and this is maybe a bit more representative of a Kenyan village where the houses are slightly disorganized. You've got some clusters close together, then you've got some over here and some all out on their own. There's not these nice, perfect parallel lines running everywhere. So when you're thinking about this spinning and randomly walking and so on, you can, again, depending on where you start, what your starting point is, there may be some villages, some households, sorry, which are much, much more likely to be selected than other ones. So if you're thinking of a central point here, any direction is equally likely to be selected. So if you're going in this direction, there's lots of houses over here, but in this direction, there's only really one or two. So you'd expect these houses over here from our sort of central location to be much more likely to be selected than the houses over here where it's, it's a bit more densely packed. So you've got to think quite carefully when you're doing this, this random walk or spin the pen approach of whether the environment, whether the village that you're working in is likely to give you something which is completely unbiased. So there's lots of other different approaches that you can use. Um, 
And the first one is, is maybe nicely illustrated by these two images where these days we do have quite good satellite images of almost everywhere in the world. As we can see on the right from the small town, small village near Lake Kasumu, we can more or less see every single building within the village. And we could either think of mapping out the entire village and putting a number to every single household in that village. There's maybe a hundred or so that I can see on here. Go through and label them one to a hundred and then randomly pick the uh, houses from there. Or we could say, okay, I can put a box around here and randomly pick a, a GPS coordinate and then find the household nearest to that randomly selected GPS coordinate. So we don't necessarily uh, need, oh, sorry, we can even have this selection done in advance if we've got a nice map, which has got all the houses identified, or if we've got an area where we can randomly pick some GPS points. Neither of those approaches are perfect either because this image, this may be out of date. Uh, there may be new buildings produced since the image was taken. Or it may be difficult to see, okay, which is a large building where multiple households could be within the same building. Or there could be some buildings which are just left abandoned and not there, nobody lives there anymore. Or they're just storage, or they're a church rather than a house, or something which is not clear from the satellite image. And similarly, with, with picking a random GPS point, you're more likely to pick a larger household, one with more land or one which is further away from anywhere else than some of the more densely packed households because there's, there's more area covered by that larger household. So these are also not perfect techniques. We might need to think of adapting it to our specific context. And the best options I can see in the chat, Alex asking, okay, do we need to have a list of every single unit in our population? The answer is no, but at the same time, in order to do it as best as we possibly can and be really 100% confident that we have done this correctly, then we would need to have that list. But this would be extremely time consuming and extremely expensive and probably not feasible when we get to a very large population. So it's nice to have, but it's certainly not essential. We need to, again, come up with a trade-off. And whether that is spinning a pen or whether that is thinking of a satellite image or whether we do not thinking of mapping the entire population and coming up with a list of the entire population, but breaking it down into smaller groups. And you can do maybe a participatory mapping breaking it down into smaller clusters and then coming up with a list within that cluster could be useful or the GPS sampling could be useful or even the spin the pen option could be useful depending exactly on the environment you're working with. There's a nice paper that I've included a reference to uh, at the end here which is looking at the impact of choosing different uh, what they call second stage so within cluster sampling methods uh, they're looking slightly more in urban areas, but I do like the uh, final conclusion that they come up with from that paper, which is bearing in mind the limitations and the available resources and feasibility, the investigators should choose the most appropriate method for their particular survey context. So what they basically found going through in that paper was all of these different approaches have pros and have cons, and we need to try to adapt them to the context that we're working with. And even in Niger, where this study took place, they found different niches where different approaches looked like they would be more beneficial than others. And this is also an issue if we're not thinking of people. So again, I've been talking a lot about people, but all of these principles are quite similar for if we're thinking about soil, for example, within a farm. So this is an example of a, a tea farm, a tea plantation in Tanzania that I found. And so if I'm now thinking I would like to do some, some soil sampling of this tea plantation, how exactly should I go about this? Because I can't sample every single piece of soil from my tea plantation. 
So there might be few different options that we can think of. Again, I could think of taking some random points, mapping it out in a similar way to, it, to my, my GPS approach and saying, okay, here's 10 random points and I'll take soil samples from these 10 random points. Or I might think of a stratified approach. I might think, okay, I can see that the soil at the bottom of the hill here where it's a bit shady, this is gonna be quite different to the soil here, which is on the slope versus this soil, which is on this flat bit at the top of the hill. So I'll take a few samples within each of these different environments, each of these different strata, so that I can compare what's going on in the different parts of the farm. Or I might think again, okay, let's just do a grid and have a nice, perfectly spaced grid and have evenly spaced points all across the farm so that then I can get something which is maybe gonna allow me to draw a map across my farm of the different soil going on. And I've got nice regularly spaced points so I can do some nice mapping from having regularly spaced points. Or I might be thinking of, of doing say a Z sample, not doing a full grid, but maybe following a transect of going along the top, then across the hill and then down the hill uh, and sampling every 10 meters along the way, for example. So I'm going to get a transect. So I'm going to be covering all of the different environments in the farm. But it's a perfectly valid approach for sampling within the farm, taking soil samples within the farm, but they would have different uh, reasons why we might do it. So if we're trying to compare lots of tea plantations to each other, we might only want to take a few random samples because we're not really going to be getting into the detail of okay, what's going on on this specific farm for comparing the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. We just want to compare 100 tea farms to each other. So we just want to take a few random points. If we're more interested in this specific farm, then we might be thinking about different questions here. Of, do I want to produce a map of the soil? Do I want to try and make sure I have covered something which is maybe a bit more representative of all the different types of soil across the farm, which would be the, the Z? Or do I want to specifically compare soil in one part of the farm to soil in another part of the farm? And so again, there's lots of different approaches where we need to match the sampling technique to what our overall objective is. There is no single right answer for this is the way we should always do it. So all four of my, my questions I've been trying to talk through, what am I representing? Who am I sampling? How am I sampling? How many am I sampling? I said there was a bit of a hierarchy in there before, but there's another level of hierarchy, which I think this comes very directly from the first presentation in this seminar series, which, uh, which Rick gave of what is the question? We can only answer these sampling questions uh, if we have a very clear understanding of what questions we're trying to do within our research. Because all of these different questions, the way in which they interact and the way in which we answer them will be tweaked for different contexts and for different questions. So unless we really come up with a good question, we can't come up with a good sampling design to solve that question either. And I think that's my big summary of if you haven't already uh, watched Rick's seminar, if you weren't able to join that when it happened, uh, that was available online to rewatch, as are all the other seminars that we've done. I think this one will be soon if, or now if you're watching it on YouTube already. Uh, I've also included here some links to be going further. Some of these I've talked about already um, in terms of the uh, infographic for different sampling approaches and the paper that which I referenced before. There's also a very nice video which goes into more detail about different soil sampling techniques uh, and a YouTube playlist which was produced uh, to go through different areas of sampling in a bit more detail. And we also have uh, produced not for uh, RMS for CCRP, but one of the resources we've produced in the past is something called a sampling decision assistant, which might help you work through step by step that sampling approach, trying to match that sampling approach to your questions. 
So that can be quite a useful resource, hopefully, to look at. Okay, I think this is the end of my presentation. So if there are more questions. Thank you, Sam. We have one more question from David. He says, comment about first stage and second stage sampling. Okay, so here you mean the issue of sampling the villages from a list of villages and then sampling the households from within the uh, within the villages which have been selected, I think, unless you are uh, meaning something else from that. So I think the key thing here when we're thinking about the multiple stages, the multiple levels, is we need to be working out how we are allocating the design and how we are sampling at each stage. So usually we would have a situation where that first stage we're thinking of something which is like a village or like a region or something which is going to have a lot of these within our total population. But within each of those things that we're sampling, there is still then a lot more other things. So it's gonna be this hierarchical approach. And in that first stage, we will usually have a list of all of the entries. So we will usually have a list of all of the villages or all of the um, regions within our country, for example. And so at that point, we then have to work out this trade-off between how many units do I take at the first stage and then how many units do I take at the second stage? Because our standard sample size calculations will jump straight to that second stage. They'll jump straight to saying, okay, N is 452 and not necessarily think about, okay, but how many villages do I need to get to get my 452, which is then, thinking about this issue of am I able to assume that there is no difference in all of my villages, which is not a very sensible assumption 99% of the time, or is there gonna be a large difference in my units in that first stage? In which case I need to start thinking about the, um, the sampling efficiency and the clustering and so on. And that becomes a very key criteria to be worrying about in this two stage process. And then within that second stage, you'll have the added complication, usually of not having a list of every single household within a village. So coming up with the right approach is going to be a big problem or going to be a big challenge, which will need to be sorted out when we think about it.